who Inland is, just for a minute, just so you have kind of relation to our company. We're like the biggest company you've ever heard of, like to kind of joke around with that. We're gonna talk about, um, uh, just kind of review a couple more things on tender, tender exchanges, the deadlines, and things to think about. And we're talking about mainly the Delaware Statutory Trust. We're gonna dive deeper into the BST and how this can be beneficial to you. Before today, how many of you by raise of hands heard about the Delaware Statutory Trust before? Oh, that's pretty good. It seems like years ago, like no, no one ever heard of this, you know? And this is uh, a newer type of investment for a lot of folks out there. And before we get started, just a reminder, you know, the Delaware Statutory Trust, the DST, is a security. It's a securitized program. So, for example, I'm a, I'm a licensed financial advisor. I want all my securities licenses even to talk about it. Um, so this is for credit investors only. Some of the risk factors, uh, when you invest in a DST, you get a booklet, uh, a private placement mem memorandum, kind of like a prospectus. And it's a couple hundred pages, and they even give you 50 pages of risk factors. We have to make up every scenario that could happen uh, in the world and explain it to you in general. So um, just to get started, um, when I say inland in California, what do you think of instantly? Inland Empire, Empire right? So in California, I, have to, I feel like I always have to explain this. Uh, we're not located in the Inland Empire. We're actually started by four Chicago teachers that met in the 1960s. Uh, this is a very famous story in the investment world, which I'm, I'm sure you'll figure out here in a second. But the four teachers met in teaching school in the 60s, and they realized they're not gonna strike it rich, right? Who does teaching school, right? I asked them once, um, how much were you making back then? It said about $6,000 a year, right? Which is still not a lot of money back in the 60s. Um, they had weekends off, they had summers off, they knew this going into it. And they met in the same teaching fraternity, and they had this idea. They said, hey, you know what? A couple of us have some experience in real estate, we studied it. Why don't we buy some real estate uh, while we're teaching, manage some properties, get a little extra income, right? To not, not live in, uh, in poverty uh, in general. So what they did was, in the 60s, um, they got some, some benefits to go into neighborhoods like, like South Chicago. So they all ended up in South Chicago at the same school, and their plan was to use the faculty lounge phone on their breaks, right? No, no cell phones back then, so I hear, right? No Instagram, no Facebook. So to communicate, you had to catch someone at a certain time of day. So their lunch breaks, and I always kind of match this in my head, like, you know, faculty lounge, corded phone, bunch of couches, people smoking cigarettes, I don't know how this looked back then. Um, right. They started making their, their, their deals, they're very private people, but they couldn't be private inside the break room, right? So they found their very first property, it was a piece of land in between two buildings in Chicago, they bought the land. So inland, in the land business, mm -hmm. from the beginning. And they built a four unit apartment building, and they doubled their initial investment. Let's just say they got a little lucky in their first deal, right? They started yeah. learning it and learning it. Can you imagine what the teachers were thinking around them? Because they're on the phone, they're, they're, they can't hide it. They started asking, can we invest with you? Right. They did another deal. They had more teachers invested, more teachers. After five years, they had so many teachers from all over the Midwest working with them, like a teacher's union of investing. They went full-time into real estate in 1967 in Oak Brook, Illinois. And yeah. in 67, when they incorporated Oak Brook, who knows what Oprah, Illinois is famous for? Other than Inland. McDonald's. It's their, their, uh, their first big headquarters in the Midwest. If you see the movie The Founder, they started in California, and the right. guy from the concept to the Midwest, it was Oak Brook. So their headquarters is literally right next door to ours. And uh, Oak Brook is a lot of different conglomerates of you know, corporations all working together. In 1968, uh, they fully incorporated, you know, laser, it's cool. Um, through the 70s, 80s, 90s, they kept, they, they were literally building apartment buildings managing them, they did everything, even the trash. They had it all moving in their company. Uh, within about eight years of the first purchase of that four unit, they were the largest apartment owners in the entire Midwest. They started buying retail centers, office, industrial, medical, storage, uh, buying existing apartment buildings, student housing, wow. healthcare facilities, uh, you know, hospitals, right? Uh, uh, hospitality, hotels. And this is the famous part, by 1989, we became the biggest owner of Walmart nationwide. We own the land and the buildings and leased it back to the Walton Family Trust. So they ran their building, out, their business out of our buildings, right? Um, today, we're number two owner of Walmart by the Walton Family Trust. We're the seventh largest landowner in America, the eighth largest commercial property owner in the U.S. Well, who's heard of Inland, right? Uh, we're a private company, but we have public entities. So we've done real estate investment trusts. We have REITs that are 10 million in size that have gone public on the New York Stock Exchange. We have qualified opportunity zones. We do 1031 exchanges. In the nation, 
Today, we are the largest securitized 10 Theron Exchange company in the nation. Uh, we've done more, more deals out there than the majority of sponsors out there. I know this is kind of daring, but this is a kind of a list of some of the competitors and um, sponsors inside the DST space. Now think about any industry, right? Realtors, financial advisors, um, real estate business. You have your big companies, you got your small companies. In the DST world, you have massive companies like Inland, Cantor Fitzgerald, you probably recognize some of these. Um, but then also you have the two guys in a pickup truck type company, right? Not to make fun of it. Everyone's got to start somewhere. But when you look at DSTs, you can't just look at all of them and say, oh, they're all great. You have to really look inside the company to say, do they have enough money to back themselves up? Have they been around? We've been around for 57 years and we've done 204 DST start to finish, which is more than the entire industry put together. Uh, this is why we're considered like the American funds, if you will, of the exchange industry. Um, the business in 45 states, you'll see me skip some slides because it's got a stock deck, but I'll, I'll customize it more for today. We've done business in 45 states uh, across the nation over the years in virtually every asset class, as you can see here, all real estate in general. Um, so as Melissa mentioned, right, you, you know, exchanges are a big deal to defer your taxes. And as she mentioned, um, if it's an investment property, you know, exchanges started back in 1921. Tenth Earth Exchange has been around for over 100 years. It used to be farmland back in the day. Um, and today, you can take any property held for investment or business use, and you can exchange it to any property held for investment or business use. So it wouldn't qualify as your personal residence, right? Because it's not a rental property. But what if you moved out of it, turned it to rental property for a couple of years, that would qualify, right? Or, or maybe you flip it around. You buy, you exchange it to a property that's your dream house, rent it for two years, then you move into it. You just need a gap in between both sides before you exchange. But uh, it allows you to defer all of your taxes, right? And she mentioned, upon death, there's a step up in basis to fair market value, the taxes go away. So you, so you swap to you drop, defer to you die, and get the step up upon death, right? Does that make sense? And that's, that's the idea to kind of the rich getting richer in real estate is to defer this and get, leave it to your heirs, right? So like the word state, the and IRS, what happens if you put them together? spells theirs and, and the idea is we kind of joke about this but the idea is to leave more money to your heirs upon death with a step up and give less to the IRS uh, in general so uh, as mentioned before money has to go to a qualifying intermediary uh, as mentioned too there's a lot of them around Just make sure they have like bonding usually they're, they're insured somehow uh, in case any losses with where they're holding your money and I just wanted to cover this for a second is as she mentioned day one starts when you sell your property this is a federal timeline from day one is when you close escrow, the funds go to the qualified EMEA. You got 45 to identify, 180 to close. But which number do you think is harder to do today, in today's market? 45. The 45, right? And the reason is, is um, today, there's somewhat of a limited inventory, right? They're on the market longer. But a lot of folks are still holding on their two, 3% mortgages, but there's still transaction volume happening. And just wait until interest rates come down this month, hopefully. Um, you're gonna see probably more volume. But what I'm getting at is a lot of folks are having trouble buying that property in 45 days. The 45 days are calendar days, it includes weekends, it includes holidays. So can you imagine you sold a million dollar property, now you're looking for a million equal or greater property out there. It can be challenging just to even get it to escrow, right? At this point, some properties are just competitive, other properties are on the market longer, right? So that's where the DST comes in, we'll talk about today, is in a Delaware statutory trust, we've already bought the properties in advance. We're not worried about closing at 45 because we're holding the inventory at this moment. So we'll talk about that more as we go along in general. And as mentioned, um, they called it 1031 like kind exchange. So as Melissa was mentioning that you can exchange a, a, a property, right? That you're renting, a residential property that you're renting into a commercial property. You can exchange um, air rights above a building. We've exchanged water rights, mineral rights. There's a lot of things considered exchangeable that are out there. Not everything can, can be exchanged, but uh, there's a lot of things out there. For example, you showed section 121, right? So if you're married to the last five years, uh, $500,000 is tax-free. But imagine you had a million dollars in growth. What about the other $500,000, right? You can put those to other things called qualified opportunity zones, for example, right? But if you moved out of it for a couple of years, turn it to rental property in general. So in 2004, the IRS created something called the Delaware Statutory Trust. This is not a private letter ruling, this is something built into the tax code. So if you, you took time to go to irs.gov, to get more 
Um, look at the Delaware Statutory Trust. Nighttime it's, reading material. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's under 2004-86 of the Internal Revenue Code. So it's been around for 20 years. But a lot of, you know, I've been in this business for 20 years doing exchanges. I've done over 5 million in transaction volumes in DSTs over the years. And uh, I can't believe the number either. Over 20 years, it's kind of wild. But what's happened is the DST, a lot of people don't know what it is because we can't just put it on bulletin boards. We can't put commercials on TV. The reason is, is you have to be an accredited investor in order to learn more about it. It's kind of funny. So accredited investor is you have to have a million dollar net worth minus the value of your personal residence or, so it's one of three boxes you check, right? You make uh, $200,000 a year the last two years, expectation making that this year, or you're married making $300,000 a year the last two years. So the funny thing is, um, this is more of a securities law, and what they're saying is, if you, if you have money, you have sophistication. But if you don't have the money, you can't get the tax benefit. So it's, it's a little bit weird, but they wanna make sure that you're sophisticated enough to understand the complexities of these types of investments to, to get invested in general. But doing a DST, uh, it's not much different than a typical exchange, right? Step one, you, you sell your, your property via a realtor. So you have a great one right here, with Melissa, right? Uh, step two, funds go into a qualified intermediary. So the point here is we're not selling your property. You sell through the realtor, right? Step two, the funds go to a qualified intermediary that triggers that 45 day clock. And between step two and three is where Sam Sosa comes in to do some paperwork to get you into a Delaware statutory trust. So you see why we're all here today. It's kind of a lot of the elements we're just missing the qualified intermediary, which there's a thousand of them. So don't worry, we, we all know them, right? Um, so doing a DST is pretty basic, as easy as one, two, three. Now when you do a DST, um, there's no investment that's right for everyone, right? A mechanic doesn't just work on a car with a hammer on everything. Sometimes you need a screwdriver, sometimes some pliers, different tools. So, but if some of these bullet points resonate with you, the DST might be a potential solution for your exchange needs. So here's, here's the top six reasons we find a lot of people like DSTs. There's a lot more than this but this is just some of the basic ones in no particular order. The first one is access to institutional quality properties. So imagine you're selling that million dollar property today in California. What does that get you anymore? Right? Yeah. It, doesn't, it, it, gets, it gets a little bit of money, but maybe you're finding a property that has like bad pipes or something and something you need to remodel, right? Um, it's, it's not always gonna get you something amazing. But imagine in a DST, it's a trust, it's a Delaware statutory trust. Think of the DST, it's just, it's, just like a, it's just like a trust that's considered like kind by the IRS. So think about IRA, 401k, 403b. Is it all kind of the same thing? Just for different uh, state plans versus individual, you get the tax deferral. The DST is just the vehicle for your exchange journey. Does that make sense? So you can have one or more properties in a DST, one or more people. A typical DST can have up to 500 individuals. So imagine we have my 100,000. See, that's the minimum investment, it's 100,000. So it's a low minimum, right? But say, say we have, uh, uh, we got Sam's million, we got Melissa's 10 million, we got someone else's 20 million coming into the DST, times 500 people, we're dealing with hundreds of millions of dollars, right? So imagine what we could buy. We were, we're now competing against the big institutional buyers of America. We buy properties that the average person could not obtain, but we can, we can get them through the DST. So for example, um, ESPN headquarters, I think we've all seen a sporting event here and there, sports center, all that. ESPN's building, their headquarters is owned by Inland. It's a Delaware statutory trust. Just trying to show you how common these are. Um, Amazon, I drove up from um, LA today. I saw that Amazon, is it in Oxnard? Yeah. Right, the big facility. Usually those, we own a bunch of those. A lot of those are DSTs, those distribution warehouses. If you ever walk in one, they're all robotically controlled, or most of it, right? and they have 100 loading docks, million square feet, but a lot of those are DSTs. Imagine owning a, an Amazon facility or a piece of one, right? Um, FedEx facilities, a lot of them are DSTs. Anyone been down by USC recently? To a soccer game or something over there? Um, we own the newest student housing facility, rooftop pool, right next on uh, Figueroa, right across the street from USC, and, and the 110 freeway, um, beautiful student housing facility. So you can find student housing facilities in DSTs. It could be apartments, hospitals, long-term care facilities. And these are uh, all considered like kind now. All considered like kind. Is there senior know. housing in there too? Senior housing, we do yeah. a lot of senior housing. This community right here is something we would own in a DST. Like 20 years ago, like kind meant something totally different. It changed, yeah. In fact, uh, it's changed a few times. Yeah. Right. And as you mentioned, was it uh, 
In the early 2000s, it changed again in 2017. Do you remember when the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act came out in 2017? Um, that's when they came out with opportunity zones, where they allowed, it, 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 I was actually in some of the meetings in Congress with this, with P Sessions, we actually met with, with the head of Fidelity. Um, they brought me on the DST side, and they were trying to figure out what to do, because before 17, you could exchange artwork. You bought that Picasso or that Banksy, one of them now, you could exchange it. Barrett Jackson, you could exchange some of this stuff. Boats, aircraft, ATMs, like you could exchange a lot of different things. So in 17, they got rid of personal property for exchanges. They said it's only for investment property. That was one of the big exchange, uh, changes that happened to exchanges back in 17. Their, their theory was let opportunity zones handle everything else, right? Stocks, bonds, mutual funds, you can put into opportunity zone. Let's say you sell a business, right? Uh, the buildings the business is in uh, could be exchanged through a DST, but the business sale is not exchangeable. Uh, mutual funds, not exchangeable because it's considered stock, right? So there's only certain things you can exchange into. So like kind has to be invested in investment real estate, basically. Yeah, all, all like kind is, is you're selling property as an investment property or held for business. It could be that dental office you own. Right. Exchanging it to another investment property. That's all it is. Any so it's broad. Property. It's so super broad. It could be any type of real estate as long as it's an investment property. That's what a lot of people don't realize because they call it like kind. It's confusing right. that you think it's apartments to apartments or self storage to self storage. It used to be like that. Right? It used to be like that, yeah. Right. So it got broader uh, over the years in general. So these are the types of properties you're finding in DST, and there's big advantages there. So we're talking about real estate. You watch the news, and, and, and it bothers me because I always say, oh, commercial real estate is so bad. It's like, well, what sector? Some sectors are doing great, some sectors are not doing so well. About 10, 15 years ago, we stopped buying retail as much. Why? Amazon. We started buying the Amazon facilities, sometimes grocery stores, because there's a lot of changes that were happening there. What's happened to office space? COVID. COVID has really hurt office space. Uh, I travel around a lot, as in the Bay Area recently, 30, 40% occupancies in office space, right? What's happening to that stuff today? Uh, we actually have a fund. I'm not I'm trying to get an idea of what's, what's happening. They're turning some of those office spaces into self-storage facilities. Um, sometimes that retail, that Kmart that's been out of business for many years, you buy pennies of the dollars to turn into a self-storage facility. Or some, some of these are uh, condo conversions with these office spaces. But you'll see a lot of changes in the market. So not all real estate is good, not all is bad. It depends on what you're looking at. So about 10, 15 years ago, what we focused on as a thesis for our company is following the silver hair tsunami, right? As people start to retire, what, what are their demands, what are their needs? And the idea was this, and this is a big segment of the population, like one out of four, one out of five people by 2030, you one out of four Americans are baby boomers that are retiring down. And a lot of folks, before they go to a assisted living facility, go to an apartment building, right? And then this is a living facility, and there's different types, and we buy all of those. So we do those in DSTs, because it's where the demand is in the economy. But where do people stuff go? Self-storage, right? What happens you don't pay rent in self-storage? See storage wars? <laughs> they, they auction it off, sell your stuff, they pay themselves back the rent. Daryl and they Sheets? escrow the rest, right? <laughs> um, stores, storage has done very well. It's one of our top performers the last 20 years. So storage facilities. One of my grandparents passed away in Austin, Texas years ago. After the funeral, literally went to the storage facility. Here's, here's, they gave me the photographs to scan on a legacy box, you know, all the digital photos and all that. Everyone had the responsibility, but you get the idea is people downsize, stuff goes into storage, they go into apartments, and their kids are going to college, right? Student housing facilities. We're not buying in like liberal arts colleges these days, because a lot of those are, are shrinking, becoming more specialized. We're focusing on the USC tier one universities that seem to have a big increase in, uh, in, um, in student housing. And I'm sure many of you probably been to a student housing facility in the last 10 years or so. Oh, yeah. It's changed a lot, right? It's no longer like Animal House, no. with John Belushi, that kind of movie style. Uh, these are resorts. Um, the one at USC, uh, I kid you not, I was in there recently, I walked in there playing music. They have a curated DJ. I mean, that just, it's playing over and over again, but they have the, some sort of music. And there's a smell, it smells like a casino. They have fragrances pumped out through, I think they're trying to hide other smells, you know what I'm saying? But they're different. There's a rooftop pool, the weight room is, is immaculate, it's amazing. So it's just like these very high-end properties. Plus the, the parents guarantee the rents over the course of the year. The USC property, the average parent, uh, makes about 350000 a year in joint income. Uh, if their kids to go to that college, they right. need to have to go to that college at least, right? And um, not to mention we raised the rents 19% year over year in the last like a year or two. 
Now, it's probably not going to continue that way, but you can imagine the lack of housing around USC and, this, and secure state properties like we have is a big deal. Um, so healthcare, self-storage, buying the Amazon, those, those big big box, you know, sale lease back type situations. We're trying to focus on quality in general. The next thing is there's no management responsibility. I mean, who really wants to manage properties, right? So there's a trade-off. In a DST, if you have 500 people, you don't want 500 people managing a property. Can you imagine that? No one gets a lot these days, right? Um, they got a honk down like five times just coming up, up to uh, Santa Barbara. I think the honking stopped around this area, right? But you get the idea that, um, uh, that a lot of people don't agree upon anything. So in a DST, there's no voting rights for people, right? Because it's, it's too chaotic. So that's why it's good to pick a good company like Inland that has the experience because we make the day-to-day -day decisions. So you lose some control, right? What's the flip side? You're on the terrible T's, as Melissa mentioned, right? What's the terrible T's? The tenants? Toilets. Toilets. Trash. trash turmoil, termites, teenagers, taxes, <laughs> right? Um, ownership in, in, a, in a, anyone's managed properties, or most of you have managed property throughout your life, uh, you're dealing with these terrible T's. So in a DST, it's passive because you're not making day-to-day -day decisions. So for example, uh, we joke about the terrific T's. We actually made this up a few years ago. So the terrific T's are, you know, time with kids, travel, tennis. I saw a pickleball sign over here at the clubhouse, but it's not a T in the work, right? Or you drive your Tesla, T1, I guess some tequila, whatever <laughs> terrific T you want to do, right? Um, I'm always trying to think of these. But the DST is passive. So in a DST, uh, I have three of these, for example. I'll be turning 48 in November, uh, but I'm already starting to kind of pare down, right? And saying, I just don't want to deal with, these are my worst properties, I'm going to put them over into a DST. So in a DST, you get monthly income. So you're not chasing the tenant for the rent check and all that. You get monthly income, usually direct deposit. So monthly income, you get quarterly updates on the property, email to you and mail to you if you want. And it'll tell you, here's the occupancies, here's the new model, court, the apartment building, whatever it is. End of the year, you get a financial statement as well as a uh, 1099. So the nice thing is it's not a K-1, right? K-1s are okay, but they always come late, right? Or they, they keep you on edge until tax time. The 1099 usually comes out between uh, January and March of each year. So an uh, average 1099 looks something like this, right? Just real simply, where this person owns 2.7% of the DST, right? So that's of the property or properties inside that trust. They received rents of $77,880 over the course of 12 months. So divide by that 12, that was their monthly income, right? But what's taxable in any exchange? The income you can't get away from, right? You can shelter it through depreciation, but you still have to pay taxes on any rental income, right? Usually you plug that into Schedule E on your taxes. So what you're taking is our numbers that we give you through our accounting, and you get your 1099, give it to your accountant or do it yourself, you plug it into Schedule E. Here's your income, which is taxable, but offset by your interest expense and any depreciation. So this is this is example is not showing your depreciation that carries over. It's showing that there was there was a, there's a loan on the property, which I'll talk about in a minute, and they got a write off of thirty two thousand six ninety four in the income. So instead of paying taxes on the full seventy seven thousand, they're paying taxes on forty one thousand in income. Right? There's a sheltering. So if you have a four or five percent income in a typical Delaware statutory trust, it might feel like six, seven, eight percent, depending on your tax bracket, with all the sheltering that's passed along to you. So in these DSTs, we're not depreciating over 30 years. We're gonna pull it down to some cost segregation, accelerate depreciation to say, let's pull the depreciation to the front of the deal. Does that make sense? So if we looked at this building, um, the plumbing has a different depreciation schedule than the electrical, than the cement, than the windows. Everything has a different schedule. We're gonna figure out all of the faster stuff and pull it to the beginning to, to juice it up. Because the typical DST, lasts about five to seven years. My last DST was three years. It could be sooner, it could be longer, seven to 10 years in a bad market. It's all market driven, but five to seven years, six years has been the average market cycle of real estate that we found. Um, so let's say you put a million dollars into a DST. Let's say five years later, we have a liquidity event, right? What happens is you got your income along the way. Every month you got your income check, at the end of it, you get your outcome. Uh, if there's appreciation, you get that appreciation as well. So if we sell for 20% appreciation on that property, your one million is now $1.2 million. That money goes back to that qualified intermediary by default, because we don't want to cause a taxable event. 
At that point, you got $1.2 million to say, what do you want to do next? Do you want to wire it into your next DST? Do you want to wire it to another property in Santa Barbara or anywhere else in the country? Or do you want to wire it to your checking account and pay the taxes? Or you do all the above. Wire 200 grand, checking account, 500,000 DST, and then 500 grand into a parking spot in Santa Barbara, right? Or whatever it might be. Uh, you get the idea. So again, simple tax reporting, 1099. We give you all the write-off of any loan on the property that we put on, which we'll talk about in a minute. But also, you might have depreciation from the property you sold. Whatever's left is gonna carry over to the new property. It's not gonna start over, but it'll offset some of that income. So what I'm getting at mostly is, in a DST, you're not losing out on the upside. Could go down, could remain flat as well, right? But we're trying to mitigate that risk. Um, but also, you get the income of the property and you get the tax benefits as well. So it's much like typical investing without all the hassle and the day-to-day -day gets you out of the tennis toilets of trash, right? The next thing is diversification. Um, so as mentioned, there's something called the three property rule. If you sold your property, say it's, I just use a million dollars as an example because I like the million dollar number. Say you sold a million dollar property. They, what they say in the IRS is you can go to three new properties, right? So you can go to three $330,000 properties um, separately. If you want to go into four or more, so outside the three property rule, you can do the 200% rule. Now all it says is if you sold a million dollar property, you can identify up to two million in real estate. So that's if you wanted to say, get $20,000 condos in, in, in Indiana, you know, something like, I don't know, where, where do you find something like that? Um, you could use the 200% the rule. So there's different rules that are done. The qualified intermediary financial advisor, everyone kind of works with you to make sure that that, that is met in general. So in a DST, there's something interesting that happens. Can you go over the 200% rule again, please? Sure. So if you sold that million dollar property in Santa Barbara, the IRS says you can you can uh, replace up to two million in real estate. So 200% of one million is two million, right? Mm -hmm. So if you wanted $20,000 condos, you could do 20 properties mm -hmm. in a DST under the 200% rule. So, so it's pretty easy to do. And this gives you some diversification as well. Now in a DST, it's a trust. You can have one or more properties, one or more investors. Typical DST might have, ESPN is its own deal. There's no other properties in it. It might have one FedEx facility, one Amazon facility. But your typical DST might have hypothetically, for example, right, uh, five apartment buildings in Florida in one DST. So if you went to that five apartment building portfolio and have a title, a name of the trust, let's call it uh, five apartments in Florida trust, right? <laughs> DST. Um, you would get the income from all five properties and be spread out amongst all five properties. You could be going into five assisted living facilities in Arizona, right? So your one investment is now split amongst five properties, or it could be 30 storage facilities in Texas and another DST. So imagine you sold a million dollar property in Santa Barbara, California. You put a third of it, 200% rule. Let's just say you put a third of it under the 200% rule into five apartments in Florida, five assisted living facilities in Arizona and 30 storage facilities in Texas. You went from one property in Santa Barbara, California to 40 properties in three states and three asset classes. So you see the diversification you can get from a DST mm -hmm. where there's no guarantees. This is not like putting money in the bank. It can go up and go down. We can mitigate the risk through high quality properties and diversification. If one property is having trouble in Florida, it's not gonna take down all of your, your income. It's not gonna kill all of your, your uh, principal and or appreciation potential and notice that they're all in blocks of storage or um, healthcare or apartments because who we're selling these to are those big real estate investment trusts. They get a billion dollars, they want to buy a bunch of apartments. Or maybe it's a pension fund. They got to fund their liabilities. And the income off stocks and bonds isn't going to cut it. They need some real estate too. So they want to buy a whole bunch of storage facilities or apartments. This is typically who the buyers are, the big institutional uh, buyers of America. So again, in a DST, you're out of the management, high quality properties, get diversification in general. Now this is where it gets a little more complicated is, uh, remember I'm also just talking about boot on the property. So the rule is, as she mentioned, you sold a million dollar property, you have to go back and do a million in real estate equal or greater. So after the real estate fees, your net proceeds is what you gotta replace. And the IRS doesn't care if you have a mortgage or not on it. All I know is like a math equation. You sold for a million, we want you back to a million on this side of the equation or on the buy side. So when you say equal or greater, greater means you can come out of pocket with equity 
money through your bank and buy more real estate, you can take on a bigger loan and get more real estate, but anything less is taxable, right? So you sold a million dollar property, you buy eight hundred dollars property, you're paying taxes on the two hundred grand that you did not replace, right? So where this gets complicated is if you have a mortgage, you're a million dollar duplex in Santa Barbara, uh, you sold it, but there was a mortgage of five hundred thousand dollars. What happens to that loan? It's paid off to the bank per, per escrow. They wire the funds into the into uh, the loan to pay it off, right? What's left over? Five hundred thousand goes to the qualified intermediary. 500,000 gets invested in your next exchange. But the rule is you have to get back to a million equal or greater. So most folks have to go to a bank and get a new $500,000 loan to replace their debt. Does that make sense? Sure. Because you're getting back that same. So if you sold for 50% loan of value, your new loan has to be 50% loan of value equal or greater. It could be 60, 70, 80. You take out more debt, get more write off, but anything less is taxable. So if you sold out 25% loan of value on the property, you need to get back into 25 equal or greater. Now imagine the IRS creating the Delaware Statutory Trust and they're saying to themselves, we got 500 investors, right? That have different loan needs. Some have no debt, some have 20, 50, 80% LTV. Loan to values, how do we make this work? So they realized it would be fee intensive to get everyone approved for a loan. Can you imagine that? Credit score oh, and geez. loan approval for up to 500 people is like chasing, herding cats, right? right. It's a nightmare, it's, it's financially expensive. So the IRS, made a special exemption. They said in 2004, when the DST came out, they said, okay, DST sponsors. They said, Inland, we, as a company in Inland, can put a loan on the property. We get our own financing through a third-party bank, not our own, we, don't, we own our own bank, but we don't use our bank, we use third-party banks to get financing on the property. Usually a better rate than most people can get, right? Because they're a big corporation. You can absorb our debt on paper. So if we have a 50% loan to value deal, and you're selling at 50, you can replace into our deal you don't have to get financing. Does that make sense? So there's no loan needed. So what about people that are retiring, don't have that income stream to get the new loan to replace on their property? There's no credit check, there's no credit score needed. We're handling the debt service, we're not worried about your situation. You're just bringing your equity into the deal and replacing it with debt on paper. But here's the best part of it. Since you're replacing it and utilizing some of our debt on paper, you get all the write-off on that leverage. All the interest expense write off goes to you, and you never have a loan. The loan's not yours, so it's not recourse to you. The banks can come after you because it's in, it's Inland's loan. It's our loan on paper, not yours. Mm -hmm. Yes. So a question. Sure. So if you're selling to those people that are downsizing, then you use the Inland monies that you're holding in reserves as um, rollover money or investment, which you're allotting other investors to buy down. So you're turning it into um, loan money. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like loan it's money. Area. It's, it's still our loan, but you're gonna absorb enough of your loan on paper to get your, your needs met. Correct. So some DSTs. So it's your loan. It's our so loan. You're making the interest. We make the your, payments. Your, your, your issue. But it's your equity coming in. Correct. But yes. IRS says your debt's taken care of, but you get all of the the tax benefits of the loan without having liability loan yeah, on you at all. So How do you recoup your money? How do you, the the loan loan? Loan. How do you recoup your money from us not having brought in the loan money or whatever to come so, off of the interest? Yeah, they borrow from the bank. Let's imagine that uh, you need a 20% loan, loan advance. So you, you have a million dollar property. You're putting, uh, you have a 20% loan. So let's say uh, 200,000 is debt, 800,000 is equity. So what you do is you're gonna put your, let's say you're going to a 20% LTV DST that we have 20% on, the, on the, the DST in general. What's gonna happen is you're gonna bring your 800,000 in, we're gonna pay income on your equity. The 200,000 that's debt, we're not gonna pay any income on that. It's gonna offset the debt payment. So it's all factored into one beautiful little payment um, that's, that's put together in general. This is where it gets a little complex, but it's like, there's lots of little, little caveats to look at. But the beauty here is some DSTs have zero debt. So people don't have debt, don't want it, don't need it. So we have zero debt DSTs. We've, we've we have different leverage points, right? We have another DSD that might have like 40, 45 or 50% debt. Some of our DSDs go to 80. These are special DSTs for people that need, need a piece of it. So the beauty is say you need 25% loan of value, but no one has a 25% loan of value. We don't have it, no one else, that's not typical loan amount, you'll find. What you could do is go to two different DSTs. Put half your money into an Amazon DST with zero debt. Put the other half your money into a property number two of uh, five apartments in Florida that's at 50% loan of value. 
50% and zero brings you to 25 or something on the value. So you can put enough over here and over there just to get the exact little value you need. But you can play with this too. Imagine you've owned uh, an apartment building in Santa Barbara for uh, 30 plus years, it's fully depreciated. Your loan is gone, right? So if you go into an, an, a zero debt DST, you don't have any depreciation following it. It's already been burned off. You're not gonna pick up much because there's no loan on the property anyways, right? But what if, I'm not promoting debt, but here's, there's, here's what gets created with the financial advisors like Sam Sosa, is when they look at your financial plan, they can say, all right, if you want more income than that typical four or 5% net income, and then I want the income on a DST, if we went from zero debt, we absorbed Inland's debt, that's our debt, not yours, not recourse to you, at 50%, what we could do is there's more risk on the property level, but the debt's, that's not yours, but all that interest expense from the loan will go to you. So what's gonna be is if you're getting, say, 4.5% income, it'll feel like five, six, eight, seven, eight percent depending on your tax bracket, because you're gonna juice up your, your cash flow. I'm just saying this is where it gets creative, is you can use it to your advantage. Okay, but just, just to make one sure. thing clear about that is because of the added debt, you get a, you get a, a, a new depreciation schedule, and that's that tax write out sort of makes it feel like yeah. like a much higher cash flow because you get to keep more of that four or five percent income. Exactly, it's it's a way to say you have to have a certain income level. It can it can juice you up, but again, there's more risk on more debt on a property in general. Yes. How does, how does incurring more debt give you depre depreciation? There's there's. It creates, um, it just creates some new depreciation because the interest expense on the loan will give you some more write-off because of the well, financing. Not depreciation, write-off. Write-off, yeah, it's just more interest okay. expense on the loan. Okay, I agree. Yeah. And the other question is, if you put $100,000 down on a property, are, are you, is that something you can recover without having to invest it in a tax 1031 exchange, or do you have to put in all the money, even the equity buildup that you've had? All of it. To defer all your taxes, even your cost basis, what you put in, everything has to be put in. It's whatever you sold for is what you got to replace. Okay, so if you sell yeah. for a million and you bought it for eight hundred thousand, you put hundred thousand down. You're going to get three hundred, but a hundred of it is return of your own money. You still have to put that into the DST. Yes, that's correct. Now. There's some more calculations. There, there is some nuance to that. And you, you remember Charles, the, uh, the CPA that came to the first event that you and I uh, went yeah. together here, um, he was talking about how sometimes, and this is where you really have to have a CPA that knows what they're doing with regards to DSTs, depending on what your leverage is on the loan, on the exiting property, right, if it's very low and you're able to leverage up to lever up a little bit, say, say that it's paid off, and then all of a sudden you get a 30, 35% loan to value on the new one, right? Debt ratio on the new one, there may be some taxless booth that you can take at the close of escrow. So there is a situation where you can design and get some of that return to capital without without any taxation, but, or yeah, or but, but you really need to have a CPA that knows how to structure that um, and you know, otherwise you can get in trouble with the IRS. Yeah. And by the way, it's always going to be an opinion because if you get audited, then all that matters is what happens in the tax court. And you know, I'd rather be conservative than <laughs> to end up at the mercy of tax court. So, exactly. Anyway. That's where this is, this is kind of a. It's, it's like there can be seminars on every little topic. Literally, I can, I can go. In we can all go in different yeah. directions. Right, but right. but that's why we're, we're all coming together to figure out your specific plan. You're talking about on rolling money over. Um, is it a fine line when someone says my and down payment investment from a subsidiary piece of real estate might be a write off as a pre investment? Did I understand that correctly? No. Is it BS? Well, I don't know about. There's a fine line now. On a subs okay, if you sell a piece of property and you take the hundred thousand and invest it into another piece of property, is oh, that I see. yeah, you you can you can buy from this. It's not a subsidiary. What you could do because it's all like kind. Let's say you got a million dollars, you could put five hundred thousand to DST, five hundred thousand into a local property, right? It's all considered like kind, so it'll all be considered shameful. Is that what you're asking? If you take yeah. pieces, so and what happens? In DST world, a lot of times is, for example, someone sold a $2 million property, but they replace it with a $1.8 million property. 
the $200,000 that's left over could go into a DST. We can work together. Or vice versa, where the bulk goes into DST and some goes, because it's all considered like kind. DST is just another option. So it's all there. So a lot of realtors will use it as, a, as the leftovers. If you know exactly what you want, there's this piece left over, because we can do it to the penny, right? In the DST, which is nice. And then can you also roll money over? They say like children under X amount of age of the Dallas Wealthy Tree member can get gifts of five to seven thousand dollars a year. That, can't, that's different. That, that, but that's add different. real estate, can you give that type of money to minors? Is what I'm asking. You, you can, can right? but you, you wouldn't want to do that because of the step up the basis situation. Right? It's well, better if you have surplus rather than investing it back into the holding stock, you can start your minor uh, grandchild own portfolio. But well, then you pay taxes on it. That's the whole point. Actually, I have some slides. I'll be talking about passing on real on, on the DSTs and how it works. Yeah, I'll go through examples. We'll, we'll see if that answers your question because okay. I'll actually go through a couple scenarios where people, because the whole idea of this too is to pass on real estate to your heirs. You know, right. you can put this in your trust, which we'll talk about. So here's yeah. one more example on the debt side. This person sold a $1.1 million property. So imagine this side of the equation is what you're selling. That's you, right? You're selling your property. This side of the question, equation is a DST. This is an inland property. So inland went out and we bought a property. We put leverage on it through our, our bank we chose of 48.5, right? This person is selling for 45% loan to value. So what, what do you have to replace with? They sold for 45? Buy for 45 equal or greater. So what they chose was they just found the next DST that was closest to their leverage that went upward to not pay any taxes. So they're gonna go uh, three and a half percent in debt, right? But notice that their $1.1 million investment turned to 1.165719. They absorbed another 65719 in in loan, in leverage, right? Which is gonna give them, it's gonna offset them a little bit extra. So this is what a lot of people do, is they'll just go equal or greater. In this case, they went greater on the DST, right? Does that make sense to everyone? You can blend them, you can just go up, up the next mark if you wanted to in general. This is estate planning, what we're talking about here in a second, is this is one of the big, um, rushes on DST right now is as we had that silver hair tsunami of the baby boomer generation retiring, there's a lot of assets going to kids, right? There's a lot of inheritance trillions getting passed in general. But what happens, as mentioned, when you, let's say husband and wife have two kids, Bobby and Sally, making this up for fun, like a nuclear family, right? They have an apartment building in Santa Barbara. And during their lifetime, they want to, they want the tax benefits of 1031, right? So they, they they deal with the tenants, toilets, and trash, or the managing the management company. They never retire from the real estate, but now they, let's say they pass away. What happens? The kids get a step up in basis to fair market value. The taxes go away. They bought it for 100,000 years ago, now they sold it for a million. So now they have it tax-free to a million dollars, right? <coughs> um, but what's the problem here? Is now in the trust, the kids have 50-50 at apartment building. One kid's been massively successful it says, you know what, I played not long when I was a kid, I remember that property, it reminds me of grandma, grandpa, whatever. I don't want to sell it. The next kid says, you know, I have some gambling debts in Vegas and credit card debts, I, gotta, I need to sell it, right? They have difference of opinion. One thinks it's worth one million, one thinks it's worth 1.5, right? One, you know, one wants to refinance, another one doesn't. You can see the issues. Uh, 20 years of this business, give any two good kids money and see what happens. They're gonna fight. I've been, I'm in those meetings with like the family members, all these, every situation you can imagine, we've seen it, and it's just it's just wild to see what happens. I mean, who, who wants your kids fighting upon that? You're not gonna know about it, right? <laughs> but who wants it, right? Okay. So scenario number two, um, husband, wife, two kids, Bobby, Sally, million dollar property in Santa Barbara, uh, apartment building. Uh, let's say that uh, they sell that property and they put it into a Delaware statutory trust. They go to a DST that's in Florida, right? With five apartment buildings. It went from one to five. Typically a DST, you're getting more income in our DSTs than you would because we're not buying in California, no offense. You like California, but mm -hmm. it's tough on income, right, and regulation. So we're in other states where you get usually a higher income. There's an arbitrage and there's no management, right? So now they're getting more income, right? They're diversified into five properties. They're out of the tenants, so it's in trash, they can retire from the real estate. But now what happens upon death is the DST is inside their revocable living trust and the kids get 50-50, Bobby gets 50%, Sally gets 50%. So what happens is parents die in year three of a six year DST. So the kids get a step up in year three, but now what do the kids get? They get forced income. Every month, Bobby and Sally split 50-50 the income stream. 
into their checking accounts, whatever, uh, for the next three years. So the first thing it does is it forces the kids to live off the income. A lot of parents like this because the whole rich span of Babylon philosophy is live off the income, rich dad, poor dad, passive income versus like the, you know, uh, you know, what happens when kids get money? All of a sudden they're gonna go blow it. Um, so it disciplines them over the next three years and they get forced income until the DST is sold. When the DST is sold, what's beautiful is it can go into two different QI accounts if it's set up correctly in the beginning. Now, say, say it was a million dollar property, now it's a million two. Bobby gets 600,000 in his account, Sally gets 600,000 in her account. Now maybe that three years after the step up after death, there's been a run up in the market. One kid could say, you know what, there's a little bit of new taxes, I'm gonna exchange again. They can, set, they can start their exchange journey. The other one could say, you know what, I'm gonna cash out, but they're separated. So along the way, Bobby and Sally are like, hey, you got your monthly income? I got mine, where are you going? Not very far, that's cool, me too, or whatever. <laughs> right? They can do what they wanna do, but they're on the same journey and there's no decisions they have to make together. This is where the DST comes into play. There's a situation recently where a parent had a $20 million property and four kids, lucky kids, right? So what happened was they sold that $20 million property, they bought four DSTs with a 200% rule, and they earmarked the storage DST to one kid, this uh, you know apartment DST to another kid, each kid got a $5 million DST. It was earmarked them in the trust. So when parents pass away, they get the step up, and they get the income off their DST, and they get their money at the end, when the DST is sold. And then if in that DST, if you have the reserve money set aside, that reserve money rolls over every month because it gets a payment, correct? Because the DST reserve gets a payment. So that continues to grow in earn interest, blah, blah, blah. So then at that, which said time, the children get their percentages, you can take that other investment money and buy out the one child that wants to be bought out. So you retain it within the family portfolio. If one Correct. Well, it's even easier because what happens is $20 million property, each kid had a $5 million DST, four kids. Upon death, they had their own income stream. They had their own property, their own. One might perform better than another, but it was set up in advance. A ship was sailing and maybe one kid did better than another, but at least they were, they were separated before all that went in, you know? Yeah. So it's a very easy way. This is what a lot of people are doing is, is they want the tax benefits of tons of exchange. They just don't want the, the hassle of management. Everyone wants high quality properties. They don't want to have the financing on their back. So it's a nice way to put into a DST, de-risk yourself of not having the loan on your back, pass it to your heirs without the fighting. But this is just kind of the basics of DSTs in general, right? But also it could be used as an insurance policy. So maybe you're selling your property and Melissa's found you a beautiful property in Santa Barbara and you know what you know what neighborhood you want to be in on this investment property. But what happens if that property falls out of escrow after day 45? You're, you're out of luck, right? You don't have to pay taxes on that. What she could do through Sam is identify property two and three as a DST, as a backup. There's no there's no money that changes hands to identify a DST and to hold, we can actually hold pieces of equity in a DST for you uh, with certain rules that are followed. And my point is that let's say your property number one falls out of escrow, property two and three are DSTs, you have a backup in case you fall out. That's why it's so bulletproof is you got backups in general in case something happens. Because a lot can happen in real estate, right? You fall out of escrow, financing falls apart, someone changes their mind, right? A lot goes down today and it's just nice to have an insurance policy that you're building yourself. It's not real insurance, it's like an insurance policy, if you will, uh, utilizing the DST. So there's a lot of benefits here where if you're looking for high quality properties, getting out of management, you want some diversification for safety's sake, you don't want to take out the financing, put in your state plan, um, or use it as an insurance policy, the DST could be right for you. And so the beauty is this, back to that 45 days we talked about earlier, 45 is hard to find properties, right? In Inland, we went out and bought that property or properties in advance. We created the DST in advance. Uh, for we bought it first, we put the market for it, right? We go to a bank, we give our approvals, the bank gives their approval on the loan for that property. We then file these with the Securities Exchange Commission, you don't want to mess with that, right? A dot your I's, cross your T's, goes out to the financial world. Um, uh, all these financial advisors have access to third-party due diligence reports, which they review, uh, in order to say, hey, this, this passes the test, right? Because they have to trust but verify that 300-page document through a third-party company that flies out, kicks the tires. There's companies that make their living doing this. They kind of get, it's like a ratings agency, right, in a way. Um, and based on that, they select the DST. So my point is, we're, we close in advance, loans in advance, right? Um, due diligence is done multiple times in advance, so you can do yours as well. 
So you're just selecting from a menu, like going to a restaurant and saying, I want the burger, I want the steak or the fish, I'm getting hungry, right? Get the idea. You have different choices based upon not just Inland, but other options are in the market. I think we're the best, but there's other good companies too. And you can choose to, to make your, your plan. Yes, sir. So if I understand correctly, the, the DSP always has shares available for those who want to, so that means you're carrying shares with your own money and then you're selling, selling them. It's a good point. The DSTs are kind of like a closed end fund. What's an open fund? Like a mutual fund, right? Mutual fund has like a, a billion dollars, but they're gonna acquire another billion dollars in the next few years. And it's, it's kind of like, you know, shares are being sold and bought. It's like a bank, right, going back and forth. The DST is, we bought those five apartments in Florida. You know the exact addresses. You know exactly where you're getting. And we're not gonna buy anything else. So it's like, once, say it's, say it's a $200 million portfolio of five apartments in Florida, once the $200 million is, is brought in with everyone's, everyone's money, that ship sets sail, right? It's on its own journey for the next five to seven years, typically, until it's sold uh, at some point in the future, right? Usually an unsolicited offer, or we put it for self, sign on the portfolio. Um, the main point there is that, uh, speaking to a lot of for a question. Yeah, so, answer. so you keep shares available oh. for people who have you want to get into one, if yeah. they're closed, then all the money's there, you have to start a new one or something. So the DSTs, they come out and close in fun offerings. So for example, we might have these four different DSTs right now, these apartments, the self-storage, this Amazon facility, whatever it might be right now. And as they get full, filled up, we close that one down and that ship sets sail. But then we bring another DST to market. And for continuity's sake, usually if we have this apartment, the self-storage, whatever deals, we've already bought the next apartment self-storage deals in advance, a month or two in advance, or waiting to securitize them. That's how we keep the continuity of, of this business going. So it's constantly a new deal. For 57 years. It does for a lot of years, and the DST will last 20 years. So generally, we're planning ahead. We're planning way ahead. And, and, and in addition, uh, we're going to stagger the debts differently. We have an idea. But this is what's beautiful. We buy those properties in advance. A lot of companies use like a bridge loan, costs like 15, 20%, whatever it might be, which is dangerous because what if you don't raise all the shares, get it all sold out, you're, you're paying on this big loan. The, so one thing that's different about DST before I close up here is most private equity companies, what they do is, and we have a deal like this where if we make you a dollar, we take 20 cents as a back end profit, right? A performance fee, that's very common in the private equity world. DSTs, the IRS doesn't allow you to do that. You're not allowed, we're not allowed to take a chunk of your money at the end, right? And say, take a portion of your profits as, as a performance fee. We make management fee off the management of the properties, you three to 4% of the gross rents. What I'm getting at is, the founders of Inland said, you know what, they're very frugal individuals, more Buffett types, right? They said, you know, we don't wanna get a bridge loan, that's very dangerous. Plus, we don't make money off the back, so what if we just invested with you? So what they do is they buy it with their own money. They have a billion dollar buying fund. So we buy it in cash, we get a better deal too, not having financing the property, and we can hold it forever. What they do is they, they held back uh, three to 5% of every DST, um, almost all of our investments that we've ever done as a company, and that's how they've made millions, is off literally investing with their investors. And Warren Buffett has a famous quote, he says, you know, uh, uh, eat, you should eat your own cooking, basically. If it's, if it's good enough for you, it should be good enough for him, and so they buy it alongside you, so if the fund makes, if the DST makes a profit, they make a profit too off the back of it, which a lot of companies are using the, the financing or mezzanine debt. And it makes it three to 10 years. The, the, the term is set up at the beginning. Yeah, so, so the term is, the term is there's no sunset clause in a DST. Uh, the DST is, because you don't know if you're like, it's 2008 market, you know? Right. Um, you don't know if it's, uh, That's what I'm you don't know if it's gonna be like the start of COVID, right? Where right. things are kind of frozen up. So we don't, we, we don't leave it to chance. We, we don't wanna have like, it's gonna be five years and here's the date of exit. Right. We keep it a little bit open. That's, what I'm That's why it's usually five to seven years right. that you're that you're in these before yeah. those go out, right? Because it's self time. Because it's hard to predict what's gonna happen in the future, right? That's what I was wondering. Not if you're a fourteen teller. Yeah, right. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't know what's gonna happen, right? Funny story, uh, Labor Day, I was on, a, on my friend's boat and the son of the you know, movie The Big Short, uh -huh. Christian Bell's character, it's his son. Um, and I think he has a little bit of that autism or whatever, you know, it makes him super smart, but like, and I was talking to him and it's kind of funny because think about 2008 and there's certain people that were predicting those markets happening. You just, you just never know what's gonna happen, right? So you just try to like, 
go to different sectors, hope for the best, but the typical cycle has been five to seven years. The 07, 08 market was just a longer time horizon, right? But most people doing exchanges want to swap to the drop before they die. They don't really care about getting the equity back right away because they don't want to realize the gain and pay taxes. So um, I think I went too long. My apologies. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Thank you. You guys can fill out your feedback sheet. Um,